Well, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this is the second uh, IDS lecture of the winter semester, and it's a real pleasure to, to welcome uh, Robin Roth here uh, to, to speak to you today. Um, it's a particular pleasure because I. I uh, we're, we're just trying to figure out how, how exactly I met Robin and how I know her. Um, but I think she and I may be the only people in the room, apart from Siv, who speak a little bit of Thai. You Thai, Emma? <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, and uh, it's also, I think, a, a fascinating topic uh, that she's going to talk to us about today, looking at uh, the relationship between conservation and livelihoods in uh, what still remains, I think, a very contested space. In, in northern Thailand. Um, so before I, I give over the floor, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, uh, the formal introduction. Um, Robin recently joined us here at the University of Guelph after a decade as a faculty member at York University in Toronto. Uh, she grew up on Vancouver Island where she became interested in forest conservation, indigenous rights, and environment development issues more broadly. Uh, she earned her BA in geography from the University of Victoria and then went on to her PhD in geography at Clark University in Massachusetts. I hear Clark's quite good for, for ge geography. <laughs> um, right, sorry, like, someone, someone who used to be in geography here told me that once. <laughs> um, and during her PhD, she pursued research in Thailand on park people conflict and the social and ecological outcomes associated with state territorialization of forest resources. Robin's research and writing tackles issues around state conservation territories, agrarian livelihood change, indigenous-led conservation, and the conservation social sciences. Her most recent Shirk Insight grant is titled Canadian Conservation in Global Context, Intersections with Asia and Africa. But today, she's going to be talking to us about her Thai research on conservation-induced livelihood change. So please join me in welcoming Robin Roth. Thank you for that um, introduction and for the opportunity to speak today. It's, it's been useful, as I was saying before, to, to dig back into some work that really probably should have been published a while ago, but paused suspiciously around the birth of a couple of children and, um, and trying to develop that Canadian side of my research agenda. And so um, that, that project that, uh, that Craig mentioned is certainly underway and it does relate, of course, to the work in Thailand. And so this has also been good prep for me as I return to do a restudy um, in the area um, on similar themes. So, um, I also have to thank you for coming out on a Friday before a long weekend when it's like minus 15. But. So I will try to transport us to Thailand for a little while, uh, and we will feel at least a little bit warmer by the end of the talk, hopefully. Um, so the question I'm addressing today is sort of in the title, it's not exactly a, a shock, but uh, this idea of whether or not the kinds of livelihood constraints that are experienced by people who are living in and around protected areas and inhabited uh, landscapes in the developing world can somehow be liberated by capitalism. And this is a question that not enough people are um, in the policy world anyway are asking and they're assuming that that's, that's the case. So I wanted to delve a little bit into um, the process through which relatively remote communities get integrated into markets um, and market activity as a result of conservation practice. So in this case, it's the establishment of a national park that has sort of sped up a process that may have happened in a slightly different way outside of a conservation uh, context. Um, and I also want to look at the social and ecological outcomes of different kinds of market-integrated, uh, market-oriented uh, livelihood trajectories that are happening in this area. So the reliance on markets to help facilitate conservation goals is not specific to Thailand in the least, but it's part of sort of much larger global move in the conservation uh, agenda that, <laughs> as I try to see Sally. Um, <laughs> Um, part of a global trend towards a rearticulation of conservation and capitalism uh, globally in Canada as well, so that gives you some sense of what I might be talking about in my current grant as well. So I'm going to first give you an idea of this kind of transition towards market area to conservation and where it comes from before I delve into the sort of ways in which um, things are playing out on the ground in Thailand. For those of you who aren't so embedded in the world of conservation. So, um, so there's a lot of variation in conservation, lots of different kinds of protected areas with different sorts of criteria. The gold standard remains um, a territory that is devoid of human habitation and specifically kind of a national park standard um, around scientific research, recreation, certain kinds of people can go there, but you certainly can't live there and you're not supposed to extract anything from it. Um, and so in that, in that sense, historically, and, and to this day, 
conservation practice has really constrained and displaced local people from their homes and their territories. So this has resulted in a lot of conflict, livelihood strategies such as shifting cultivation, which is relevant to what I'm talking about today. Um, fishing, hunting, the use of timber and non-timber forest products have become criminalized and resident people are arrested, jailed, and in some places shot for pursuing their traditional livelihood um, practices. So this is kind of like the dark side of conservation. It's a serious social justice issue. And it's a real problem, not just you know for the brand of conservation, but it's a real problem because there's mounting evidence that this kind of conflict and this kind of um, divisive and confrontational approach actually undermines the conservation agenda. So it's not particularly good for kind of the ecological goals of conservation either, never mind the social ones. So the past few decades, all sorts of attempts have been made to try to better integrate development goals into the conservation agenda, uh, to have kind of community-based conservation, or at least presumably community-based conservation. Um, and for the most part, a lot of these attempts have been criticized for not adequately meeting conservation goals, nor adequately meeting development goals. So there's been this disillusionment uh, amongst various parties in the conservation world uh, around state conservation and how that's problematic, especially in the development world. Um, I'd argue elsewhere as well. And then uh, also that community conservation governance is not a good either, right? So kind of in a, in a natural way, what we have is um, a, a turn towards kind of markets as potentially kind of more market-based or private sector governance as another way of trying to create a more robust conservation policy. And that's happened within the context of all things that you guys are all familiar with, so the Millennium Development Goals, all sorts of from poor policy, all of that has articulated itself in kind of international agreements. Uh, most recently, um, the Parks Congress that happened in Australia in 2014, um, sort of a statement that conservation of protected areas have to play a role in poverty alleviation, that livelihood is part of the agenda of conservation and so on. So the hope here is that uh, market-oriented conservation is support of certain kinds of livelihood strategies, those that take up less space so that we can free up area to include inside of these, these gold standard national parks, right? Wilderness areas and so on. Um, that that will alleviate conflict, right? And result in kind of a more robust, um, a more robust conservation policy, like a win-win solution. And it has to be said also that this doesn't happen sort of spontaneously, but it's also within, and it's not just like the individual decision or particular organization or a particular project, it's happening within a, a larger frame, a larger cultural and economic frame that's fairly persistent. So a neoliberal context, one that naturalizes market access is the best way out of poverty. Um, and along with other uh, features that are less prominent in Thailand, but certainly decentralized uh, governance and so on, right? Promotes market-based governance as the most effective and efficient way of allocating goods and services. So the point here is that that it's part of a larger cultural frame that increases, it increasingly helps explain why conservation initiatives globally carry sort of a neoliberal logic. So all of these things have resulted largely in an increased amount of market-oriented livelihoods in and around protected areas. And I see this as sort of a dual turn towards market-oriented livelihoods um, in, within a conservation context. The first is uh, one that most people talk about, that's just a top-down promotion by the state and by environmental organizations, and in some cases by private environmental actors, um, towards things like alternative livelihood projects, promotion of high-value intensive agricultural production, so the idea that you can use smaller amounts of land, make more money, buy the food you would have grown otherwise, right? Um, and that you'll see a lot of that in my talk today. Uh, tourism and ecotourism, as well as payment for ecosystem services. So these are all sort of promoted as the top-down push towards market-oriented conservation. It seems to neglect um, in a lot of these conversations is what I just refer to as the bottom-up move towards market-oriented livelihood strategy. So um, there is a lot of people trapped inside <laughs> provincial park, national parks around the world who are looking for ways of sort of surviving. And for them, um, a lot of them are seeking out and trying to find and bring to them and re-articulate um, potential of uh, markets, specifically labor markets, but also agricultural markets. So there's a, they're also seeking um, to better engage uh, markets for for their own livelihood. So with varying degrees of enthusiasm, I have to say, some people are rather coerced about the whole thing, and some of them are, are rather enthusiastic. So the end result is increasing market-oriented governance in and around protected areas, 
These are landscapes where both livelihood and ecologies are at risk. Now the debate around this stuff is rather polarized. Um, proponents see such trends as a potential solution to what is really entrenched uh, park people conflict around the world. And opponents see capitalist markets as the enemy of conservation and the enemy of local people. So in these accounts, residents themselves are cast either as kind of hapless victims um, of a rampant capitalism or greedy destroyers of nature, while markets are cast as either the solution for conservation development, woes, or a destroyer of local tradition and livelihood. So markets are almost always seen as something external to the community into which they're being thrust. So there's some assumptions, a lot of assumptions, that are underlying the debate, but also the, uh, the kind of transition to market oriented conservation. For the, our purposes today, I'm just going to point out a few. Um, one, uh, one major assumption from proponents is that there's going to be this smooth transition to market intensive livelihoods, and that's going to result in greater protection for nature. There's a whole lot of embedded assumptions in that, two of which I want to draw our attention to. One is this sort of facile assumption that if markets are there, if we can just get people to access them or give them access, they're going to use them. Like, they're, like that, that they'll choose to sell their stuff, or they'll choose to, to change their livelihood in order to, um, to engage those markets. The other one, which is sort of contradictory, is that these folks, once they choose to uh, engage these markets, are going to then stop using park resources. They're satisfying individuals. They're like indigenous subsistence folks who are going to be satisfied with maintaining the basic standard of living they already have. They're just going to use markets to do it instead of park resources. So they're not maximizing individuals. An assumption from proponents is that residents are victims of state-imposed neoliberal capitalism. So for the most part, don't see um, individual resident farmers as agents in their own kind of livelihood trajectory and don't really take, I would suggest, their aspirations um, seriously. So there's a couple things in common here. One is that I think both of these positions hold on to a romantic notion of a subsistence indigenous producer, right? Both in the sense that they're gonna be satisfying individuals and that somehow naturally they would be subsistence producers and don't care to have any kind of accumulation strategy. Um, the second is that they, and I guess this is how they managed to do the first, is they neglect the agency of resident peoples, their aspirations, how their decisions are embedded. Uh, culturally, certainly, but socially, ecologically, and politically, for my purposes. So, the work that I'm presenting today is trying to, trying to engage those assumptions and trying to pick apart, certainly by treating um, resident peoples inside of national parks, which um, I don't want to say it's largely indigenous because they're not. They are when I, where I work, and in lots of places, and lots of inhabited landscapes that are currently being enclosed into protected areas tend to be the more remote, the ones with the least people with the least political power, and so on. Um, so those are kind of who I'm talking about. Um, so I'm going to treat those resident peoples um, as agents in their own making of their own violent strategies. So the methods that I've, I mean, it's been a grab bag, really. So. The, the work that I'm presenting today is kind of uh, drawing on a total of three, I don't know, four solid years, kind of off and on, a couple one-year stints and some four-month stints and so on, or two weeks in, um, over the last 50 years. I've looked uh, in depth at two national parks and two communities in each of those parks. Um, and I've used mostly interviews and focus groups, but I've also done participatory work such as transect walks, participatory mapping, and so on, um, and a, a two or three kind of comprehensive Service. Um, it's also multi scalar So what I tend to do, especially in my more recent, in the last seven years, um, work is I, I treat kind of livelihood strategies as uh, rooted networks, whereby I try to follow the chain up through the exit. So if someone is selling something, I'll go talk to the person that they sell it to, and then the people that they sell it to. So I kind of follow those networks up to see what the enabling and constraining factors are for people who are opting into certain kinds of market strategies. So, and this is where it gets warm. But it's not beach, I work in the north. I'm not sure it has been too great. Hi, mountains, not beaches. Um, so, northern Thailand is the most forested area in Thailand. Um, and it's been targeted for a program of protected area expansion over the last 20 years or more. Um, the forest in question, however, is not uninhabited. Uh, in fact, it's probably the most, one of the more densely populated forested areas in the world. 
and they're inhabited mostly by ethnic minority groups, some of whom predate the arrival of the Thai ethnic group, some of whom were more recent uh, migrants into what is now Thai territory over the last two to three hundred years, coming from uh, what is now Burma, Tibet, or southern China. So as such, the conservation pressures um, are met with equally strong development pressures, and the area has experienced significant conflict, uh, contestation, as Craig suggested, between resident communities and conservation practitioners of all stripes. So the Thai government has focused their policies, and kind of uniquely these days, actually, um, in real kind of top-down fortress conservation, create a territory, get rid of the people, all that kind of stuff. Now, there has been a change in the last 15 years, which you'll see reflected in what I talked about today. So the story is a common one. Resident communities feel alienated and coerced throughout the establishment of a new protected area, and they're highly frustrated. So this is a very um, common sentiment. The park is just like a big stone. You can't take anything out. You can't move it. You can't change it. It can't be here with the village, right? Um, and, and this is common throughout the region. And yet, while some leave, and some are pushed out through park establishment, uh, many stay, and they continue to struggle with their new reality on often smaller plots of land for agriculture and more restrictions on forest use. And you start hearing things more like that. Which is like, we know we need to change how we do agriculture, not sure how to do it. We see people growing cabbage. Doesn't look worth it. The effort uh, you know, costs too much. Involved, so, so these kinds of decision-making processes start to occur within uh, villages that are trapped inside these national parks and uh, something that I would term conservation-induced livelihood change ensues. Now in Thailand there has been the last few years, though I haven't studied it, um, kind of payment for ecosystem services schemes as pilot projects and things like that, but the most common kind of market-based strategies as a response to livelihood constraints associated with conservation fall into these three categories. So agricultural intensification, I'm going to talk mostly about feed corn, flowers and coffee today. Uh, vegetables are always there, it seems. Um, tourism, another big strategy. Um, and then wage labor and out-migration. So I would suggest that these are the three kind of most common uh, market-based livelihood trajectories associated with people struggling within their new kind of territory. So I'm going to talk about two parks. The first one is the one I've been to the longest. And it's referred to as Meto National Park. And you can see the landscape of this park is one made through shifting cultivation. There's multiple stages of forest regrowth. And then here in the forefront, you have an active um, hill rice agriculture. There's very little in the communities that I spent time in um, space for for paddy rice agriculture, which provides you with a more consistent yield, um, but less variety. You can't plant vegetables in the same place. So there's pros and cons, but the landscape looks really, very much like that. So Mesua National Park, the uh, Royal Forestry Department at the time, started to try to establish this park in 1997. And they started out kind of the conventional way and met a lot of resistance. And so then they changed uh, right around late 1990s uh, to some other strategy which basically consisted of them approaching each of the 60 communities inside of the park, all of whom were ethnic minority groups. And this is a park that's about 990 kilometers squared. And trying to convince, negotiate is kind of a gentle word. Um, they suggested strongly, sometimes at gunpoint, that these communities should be happy to stay where they are, but they need to reduce the amount of land they're using. They wanted them to move from six to 10 fields, uh, systems of shifting cultivation down to three or four. And they promoted the sustainable land use pattern, which was, well, if you're four, plant rice on two and grow vegetables or cabbage or whatever on the other two, and you'll be fine, right? So this is what they were trying to get communities to do. In exchange, they're allowed to stay, nice boundaries are driven you know, around the community, and then all the other land that got freed up that became forest and park land. Um, so the goal here was to reduce or eliminate shifting cultivation, and there's a lot of mapping, they zoned everyone's territory, and they effectively created private property. So these were collectively managed agricultural fields that became allocated to each household. Um, and then they established a royal project, long, complicated organization affiliated with the royal family in Thailand, which is very important, um, but effectively think of it as kind of an ag extension agency to the highlands for our purposes. So they established a royal project, and the royal project, and then they and they ran into all sorts of conflict, and this is still now, we're in like 
in the early 2000s. And then basically what happened is the Royal Forestry Department just sat and waited until the Royal Project promoted a whole bunch of stuff and got people involved in different kinds of livelihood strategies with the hopes that they could then establish the park with less uh, political conflict. So the Royal Project promoted and supported processes of terracing, livestock production such as pigs and chickens, uh, fish raising, and they targeted particularly those villages with the most conflict, because some villages went along, as you'll see. And then private enterprise also entered the area, largely uh, you know, promoting the, the growing of seed corn and providing seed uh, to do that in a secure market. And different kinds of NGO networks um, also prompted more experimentation on things like coffee, um, macadamia nuts, and other things. I actually don't even know their names. But every, every time I go back in the last 15 years, there's some new thing that someone's trying to grow, and it's being sold to the Philippines or Malaysia, and then the next year it failed. And, so there's always sorts of experimentation going on. And then there's also a lot of labor market integration, so seasonal and periodic out-migration. That wasn't supported by the Royal Project, but it's what was happening. But sure enough, kind of, it kind of works, right? So by 2015, they actually, just a few months ago, were able to officially designate the park area. And over the last 10 years, as they've been going back, conflict is certainly reduced. I mean, in 2003, one of the communities I worked in had 200 soldiers hang out for 10 days and tell them that they had to get stuff done. They didn't shoot anyone, but there's some serious military kind of might there, and that nothing like that has been happening. Um, people seem to be resigned. Okay, so the first community I want to talk about quickly, um, their primary strategy has been to grow corn and agricultural intensification generally. Um, you can see that this community has a fair bit of paddy rice, which is unique in this area. Uh, but not every family does. Only about 40% of the families actually have access to paddy rice agriculture. But these guys are, we're on that park headquarters here, that's where you just assisted. But they're like, like, they can be surveyed by the park headquarters. And so that's part of the reason that they decided to cooperate with the park establishment. And they did effectively what they were told to do. They reduced their shifting cultivation fields. Um, they dropped down to three to four fields per family. And then they really quickly figured out a strategy to survive. Um, and that was largely agricultural intensification. And from 2002 to 2009, their average income doubled. And this is why I have to go back because I should do a follow-up livelihood study. But uh, anecdotally, I've been there a few times, uh, most recently about three years ago. And that plateaued. I don't think it's increasing quite that fast, but it's still increasing, um, but at a slower rate. So the real changes happened in 2002 to 2005. Um, in terms of their strategies and their changing of the fields and so on, uh, because park regulations were being enforced, even though the park didn't exist yet, from about 2001 onwards. And so they did this by embracing market agriculture. 37% uh, were doing market agriculture in the early 2000s, and by the late 2000s, that number was closer to 80%. Um, and corn is the crop of choice in this instance. So a Naitun basically is like a money lender. He came into the community and he said, I'll give you seed and I'll come back and I'll buy it from you and here's the price, guaranteed, no problem. This is his little uh, kind of portable crusher because um, the corn can be dry, right, for, for feed corn. So they were a little tentative. He took a few of the leaders to another community where he's working with and then they agreed to do it. So four families in the first year and then it went up to something like, so four out of 68 families in the first year and then it went up to about 60% and then within like three years everyone pretty much the land for that could. Um, the other strategy is renting land, which is totally against community regulations, but they do it anyway. Uh, they do some sharecropping with the Bon, which is another ethnic group. Uh, largely I work, I think I forgot to mention, with the Karen ethnic uh, group. Um, but the Hmong who are nearby came and rented land or sharecropped with them to show them how to grow potatoes and sell potatoes and so on. Some families said this is a temporary strategy, and others flat out said, I need the 20,000 baht a year, which is about $600, uh, to send my kids to school, so I'm gonna do it as well as I can. So the social and environmental outcomes of this, this kind of intensive corn production, um, as well as there's a bit of other vegetables, but mostly it's corn, um, are varied. There is more land under cultivation for longer. So shifting cultivation, they had six to 10 fields, they would plant one of them a year. The rest of it was in various stages of fallow. Now you have four fields that are being planted with something all the time. 
So you have a much larger uh, area that's under constant cultivation, but you also have a more stable and more mature forest cover. You have a lot more chemical use. Um, and that has implications, of course, for water in particular, but uh, health as well. And uh, they're making more money, and so they wouldn't mind making a little bit more money. So uh, every year, they sort of push into the forest a little bit more. So there's a little bit of expansion happening, um, and I don't know how long that'll last. Um, there is increased conflict, and I've written about this um, elsewhere, but there's a considerably more household-to-household -household conflict within the communities about who got what land, and whose land was it really, because some of that land was shared before, and so there's a little bit more division within the community socially. And there's increased class stratification. So in the early 2000s, there was about a 20,000 baht difference between the lowest income earner and the highest, and now that's more like 76,000. So it's a fairly, fairly large spread. But the bottom didn't go any lower, the top two. Um, and they're experiencing, surprise, surprise, market vulnerability. Uh, so remember in 08 when the rice prices went up? So those communities, there's those households that decide to stop growing rice because they felt like they'd be able to just pay for the rice for um, regretted that decision really quickly. And also in about 2010, uh, the potato thing was going really well, so they all planted potatoes, but they got a blank, and they all lost their money, right? So there's these, these market vulnerabilities that are also happening. Um, okay, so... I've gotten chatty, and I'm going to figure out how to make this shorter. Um, so in another community in the same park, uh, did a very different strategy. They did not go market agriculture. In fact, the amount of market agriculture they were doing from 37% in the early 2000s from to 2009 where they're only about 20% were actually engaging in market-based agricultural practices. These folks don't like outsiders. They resisted the park. They refused to reorganize their land the way the park asked them to. So they did not give up shifts in cultivation. But what they started to do uh, because of lost access to the forest, um, they started to engage uh, labor markets a lot more. So 92% of households saw it off farm labor. They also experienced a really big jump in their annual income through this strategy. And they allocated kind of one household uh, to like do all the experimenting. So people would come in from the rural project or from private sector, they'd come in, they'd say, hey, I think you should do this, I think you should do that. And they'd all point to the one guy, and the one guy would be like, okay, I'll try that for a year. I'm going to take them and do the data collection, and then we're, we'll talk about it, right? So they really, they, they expressed to me that they didn't want to be seen as, um, as not willing, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, at the same time, they weren't going to just jump in, right? Because they were very suspicious of a lot of these kinds of projects. Um, so they sought off-farm labor, very important for youth. Uh, they would go for two to three, sometimes even more years, um, to send money home uh, and remittances, and also to save money for marriage. But adults would also go as needed. Um, these guys had rice sufficiency, so no one ran out of rice um, throughout the year, whereas the previous community, 60% uh, would run out of rice before harvest. Um, so this landscape, they maintained different stages of forest growth because they continued their shift in cultivation. Uh, but they had less mature forest, consequently, so it depends on your kind of conservation. This, this, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the shifting cultivation landscape is, has higher diversity, but it doesn't provide um, habitat for certain kinds of species, right? Uh, because a lot of species, birds and otherwise, need mature forest. Uh, very limited chemical usage in this instance, um, and they also experienced increased class stratification, slightly different. There's about a 10K spread at the beginning of the early 2000s, and after all these changes, uh, 42,000 bought spread, just over $1,000. Um, biggest concern that they expressed to me was that absent children were leading to vulnerable elders, so this out-migration strategy was also increasing um, attempted and suicides amongst the elders. Okay, so... So yeah, so kind of mixed social and environmental outcomes. These are two communities that were in the process as I was doing research with them, trying to figure out how to deal with this different kind of situation that they were in. And so then the other uh, park that I've done research in is one that was established for a long time. And they've been engaged in market-based livelihood uh, strategies for a lot longer. Uh, and so I did a different kind of research there while I was focused in a couple of communities. I traced different kinds of livelihood trajectories, specific in this instance to um, flower production, which uh, this is the landscape there. So no shift in cultivation, 
banned in the early 1970s. Um, there was a lot of opium production in the area. So a lot of the money that was earned through opium production went into hiring people to create terraces. So they now have patty rice agriculture. They have a for forest. All the kind of other buildings are a house. Our houses and the, all there is uh, flowers. It's all flowers that grown underneath plastic. Um, different kinds of livelihood strategies. There's more people here that uh, that have different kinds of jobs. This guy started his own cafe and he lives off of coffee. There's not that many people here who are able to live off of coffee. Um, but, <laughs> but he does and there's a, there's a few others uh, like him. So Dorian Fawn National Park was established in uh, 19... 72 and the Royal Project, same thing, agricultural extension came in shortly afterwards to try to get people off of opium and get them out of shifting cultivation. So there's a lot of conflict in this area. A lot of arrests, a lot of enforcement, lots of fines, a um, lot of sneaking around at dark trying to get the wind to build your house. So there's a lot of conflict in this region. But in 1999, right around the same time that they changed their approach in Meadow National Park, they started to change their approach in Doyen National Park as well. And this is the crown jewel of Northern Thailand, uh, located a lot closer to a population center than the previous park we talked about. But what they started to do is, instead of telling everyone who lived in the park, all of whom were ethnic minorities, um, that they weren't allowed to earn any money, and they weren't allowed to have access to electricity, and they weren't allowed to have paved roads, they started to do some development. They paved the roads, they gave them access to electricity, they allowed them to start ecotourism ventures, um, and they started to map out their land and give them full land tenure. So in the previous place, they don't have legal land tenure. And here, they started to give them legal land tenure even over their garden land. So not just their, their paddy race. And sure enough, the conflict now is actually quite negligible in this area. It's a lot of people talking about how much better it is uh, now than it was uh, in the 1990s. So the three kind of main trajectories that I want to talk about is cut flower production, mostly Gerber daisies, but there's a number of species that they, they plant for sale. Um, coffee, Arabica coffee, and then ecotourism. So, yeah, there's no rotational cultivation. Royal Project, people love the Royal Project there. Um, they talk about how they'd be dead if it weren't for the Royal Project, the park would have killed them. And so they've done a lot of outreach uh, to the communities in promoting vegetable production, coffee, and flower production. Um, Community-based tourism is absolutely taking root in this area, um, as are our private-based tourism enterprises, um, and everyone's really involved in market-based agriculture to some extent. So there's going to be more words up there than you need to read. Where am I supposed to finish? 415. <laughs> it's over when whatever. Yeah. <laughs> no. So I'll put them on there, but I'm just going to uh, try to isolate the important bits of that. Um, whatever I can remember, I'll say it. I've abandoned my notes. Um, so the Royal Project started to promote flower cultivation. And the way the Royal Project works in all of their crops is that they provide seed, they provide technical support, and then, then you have to sell it back to them. So you're in debt to the Royal Project, and then you need to sell it back. They will only buy the top grade A produce or flowers or whatever it is. After they've picked what they want, you're then free to go sell your other discards to someone else if you wish, but you're kind of uh, indebted to them. Private flower um, seed folks came, they started to come in in 1999 and asked to buy flowers. The farmer response was, you have to give us seed because we can't sell you these because they belong to the Royal Project. And so then they started to give them seed and they started to have private enterprise who operated very similarly to the Royal Project. Um, so community members there, uh, the big barrier to planting flowers, well, there's a few, but uh, capital is definitely one of them. Um, but flower production is really time consuming. It's a real laborious process. Uh, you have to pick flowers twice a week. You have to weed weekly. You have to fertilize monthly. You have to spray weekly. And so it's a really laborious process. And for the most part, only highly energetic folks who've already had children, interestingly, mostly because the women don't want to spray the chemicals when they're pre-birthing age, like if they haven't had their kids yet because they're concerned about I think rightly so, about some developmental issues. Um, so usually couples with young children will take this on and they'll do it for a certain period of time to try to make a bunch of money because you can make a bunch of money uh, better than anything else in this area. But it's, it's a lot of work. Their parents take care of the kids, so that works out for them. Um, 
and uh, Million Bot Scheme, which is this big cheap credit scheme that was that was put forward in the late 1990s, early 2000s, freed up a bunch of capital. So a lot of people started to take that money and invest it in flower production in this area. And I think from uh, 1998 to 2008, the area of flower cultivation is kind of the park. Um, so, so that was like why they would plant or not. It really had to do with time. They would, through their social networks, largely family and friends, they decide what kind of species to plant and learn about how to plant it. Uh, so quite a, only some of them were now involved with the Royal Project. It started to be people who weren't directly involved with the Royal Project who would start to, to do this kind of work. Um, now, as I just pointed out, if, you're, if you have um, membership in the Royal Project, then you have to sell to them. They're, they're kind of the first people you go to. And um, for Gerber daisies, they would, you know, about five years ago, they would pay about three baht a stem, whereas they could go to this other guy, this guy named Paulina, who, um, who would buy for 1.8 baht, but he'd buy anything. But it didn't matter what quality it was, he'd take it off, right? So they had these different ideas, but for the most part, they would sell to whomever they had the most. Because if you have patron-client relationships, they're still very, very um, important here, and so they would sell to whoever they did sell to. Um, out of obligation. And the patrons, I would say, also felt obliged to buy everything that these people brought to them, even though there's an income loss. Um, so uh, here, land and ecology is really important in terms of an enabling factor. Uh, they're trying to position, this is a highland area, it's the only place in Thailand you can grow Gerber daisies, and so they've got a quarter on the market, right? So there's a kind of a niche uh, market uh, ecology going on. And it requires the national park to be supportive. You know, if I were a park official, I'd be happy to see people grow flowers because it only needs to a little bit of land. So you get a sense that there's a real important thing that you can earn a lot of money from a small amount of land. Um, and for positive points, it can be practiced in a limited or not so big area, so it can help to earn more income under limited fields. Negative point is that it needs to have a broad location. This is, this is a problem for ecosystems or water contamination. And so the bonuses here is it's a lot of money, um, and people can make 200,000 baht a year, which is obscene in this area um, of the world. So they make a lot of money. They're buying trucks, they're buying TVs, they're buying washing machines, right? All sorts of consumer goods, they're sending their kids to school, and so on. High pesticide use. So this is what I would suggest is an ironic effect of this focus on like lots of production in a small area, so you can free up trees to become part of the national park, is that the pesticide use is now getting into the water. It's got some problems for birds, and this is the primary bird watching habitat in the country. Um, and so these are some of the, and, and there's fish bearing streams that are also suffering, and the plastics um, that are being used to the as well. So there's some ironic effects with this particular strategy. Coffee, a little bit better. Um, also introduced a long time ago, no market for it really, until Thai started getting addicted to coffee. But if you remember when you probably first started going to coffee, I have to, you can get a good cup of coffee in that country, and now it's everywhere, right? So successful drug addiction has occurred. And so now there's this massive domestic market uh, for coffee, and it really took off um, in the 90s. And in the 2000s in particular, when the Intertribal Development Project came into the area, first fair trade certified coffee in Thailand, um, and they, they basically developed a network of villages and members that would collect the cherries from all of their friends uh, and neighbors and they would skin those cherries and they'd sell the parchments to IBTB at, at stable rates. Um, everyone does it. Everyone's got a few coffee trees somewhere in their territory or in their, uh, under their, because it's easy, people give you free trees. It's easy, you can pick in the winter when you're not doing anything else. Kids can pick, it's all, it all works out, but it's a total supplemental income. There's about three people in the area that make a full-time livelihood off of a coffee. And they're the ones who are buying it have a machine because someone gave them the machine uh, that they're able to uh, peel the cherries and to create parchment uh, for IDTP. Um, for the most part, also patron client relationships are very strong. Uh, the guy who runs the Intertribal Development Project was born in one of those villages. So they don't actually even see themselves as selling to IDTP, they see themselves as selling to their friends, right? Um, and then for a while he sold to Starbucks, but you know. Um, so, so they're really strong patron-client relationships, and those are the, pe the people who are able to make a living off of it. There's, you, you need so much capital to start. So they had those social relations that gave them, in most cases, um, the machine. I think I have a picture of one of the machines. Yeah, I do. Um, 
was given to them and then they pay it back, right? But they had to have that um, relationship first. The park loves it. Uh, they can accept coffee more than other cops because they need a little amount of chemicals and can be planted together with wild trees. But the real downside here is, like I said, it's, um, it's a supplemental income for everybody or almost everybody. Um, but there's very few environmental concerns with it. They don't put fertilizer on it. They don't use chemicals. Um, they're not certified organic just because they can't be bothered. That's one of the wet processing machines that the Royal Project set up. So you'd go there and sell your cherries and then someone else would get the amount of money that's in the roasting side of the coffee business is that's where most of the money is so these are these are pennies right the, from the cherries to the parchment but you can make a lot more from the parchment than you can the cherries okay there's two major strategies for tourism in this area the first looks like this it's community-based tourism that um, started by after 1999 the park said hey you can do this uh, community-based tourism Authority of Thailand came in, did some research, helped them set it up. The process here is uh, each family that wanted to participate had to give them 3,000 baht. It's about $100, but it's about a monthly salary, so it's a lot of money. Um, and then they get an investment. It's like an investment, and they get a little bit of money back. And then two or three people have full-time jobs. The accommodation is cheap. It's very popular. Lots of people come. They have all sorts of problems. Um, The problems are that lots of people come and party. They're almost all Thais. It's like a domestic tourism thing. Young Thais come with their guitars, drink a lot, smoke all sorts of stuff, and they party, and, and they don't wear appropriate clothing, and it upsets the, the community members, right? Um, it's very much a supplementary income. Uh, it's led to a lot of conflict inside of the community, consequently, because some people are making livelihood off of it, some are not. But even the ones who are, so this is one guy who was instrumental in starting this tourism uh, business, and he started his own private one now. So in the 10 years that that's been established, there are now five private tour operators inside the park. This is the community-based tourism one, but they're like, ah, oh, it doesn't earn you enough money. So now they've built their own bungalows, they're turning rice fields into bungalows, they've created like handicraft stores and the whole bit. They're right up against uh, the road, so uh, they, can, they can do this. Um, there's a big garbage problem. Everyone says that there's greater environmental awareness. If you go there, you can buy fish food to throw into the river. So that, by the way, is the version of environmental awareness. Um, big problem now is that <clears throat> they've all got private land ownership, and people are borrowing money like crazy off of that land to build these bungalow operations, and they're not filling up. And so now, you know, we used to be worried that the park would take our land, now we're worried that money lenders will. So there's a strong concern that people are going to lose their land to money lenders, and some Bangkok type's going to come in there and do whatever they want inside of the community, right? Much more controlled, interesting, I think, tourism operation is this one. Um, and they saw what was going on. This is across the, this is like three kilometers away. Um, and they saw what was going on in that community and were scared of it. But they had, they had people coming in and wanting to stay in their village, right? So, and some people would do it and they'd get paid really badly and they didn't know what to do. So finally they got together. Um, I would say this is one guy. He's like, I would call him a networked individual or an innovator. Uh, he was, this is basically his story. I used to be a guy, but I didn't like this tourism. The tourists didn't gain any knowledge about the village. And there was a lot of noise. And they used to go to the same houses all the time and not pay very well. So he kind of gathered some information through his networks around different models. And the story is kind of like happenstance. Uh, you know, he's working at a restaurant. Someone over here is that he wants to do some tourism in his community. This guy from Thailand, Ophomal, which is the French ethical tourism agency, happened to be there. They have this conversation. They now have a deal. So Thailand, Ophomal, um has created, I would say, three-star, four-star accommodation. There's no pool, but uh, kind of like really nice, comfortable accommodation for Highland Thailand in this community. About um, in fall all the time, and they have constraints. Um, on visitors. So there's only a certain number of visitors allowed in the community at any one time. Those visitors have to be interested in current culture. They have to dress appropriately. They are not allowed to drink. Right? There's all sorts of rules around their visit and it's very controlled. And the house um, is off in the rice fields, uh, not in the community itself. Um, the village gets, so anyone who, um, they work on point systems. So they don't, they give money 
community members didn't give money to the to the tourism operation, they give time. And they get a number of points for however many hours they work doing stuff, right? And then that gets turned into money at the end of the year, depending on how much profit there is. 10% of your earnings have to go back to the community. And that community fund gets used for infrastructure development, uh, scholarships for kids, um, environmental awareness, and so on. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a sense that it is helping reproduce culture because they are, because people who are coming are interested in crime culture, so youth are starting to learn some of the old crafts again because now there's a market for it and so on. I don't know if I explain that's true, but there is a sense of what's happening. Um, and the benefits accruing to individuals are largely monetary, um, and they rotate, they're very clear, right? You don't get to guide every time, you take your turn in a list. Um, there's three people who earn a monthly salary from Thailand and Tomo, um, and even those people change every three months. So, uh, it's still supplemental income and the demand is increasing. So, they were very authoritative when I first talked to these folks about how this was gonna happen, and within five years, the neighboring village also has a new house, and there's another house being built further down the road that has higher capacity. So I don't know exactly what's gonna happen, but there's an increased demand for this kind of elite cultural tourism, um, and they pay. So they made as much money in the first year they established with, they had a maximum of two people, because they get any one time, it was full the whole year, um, and they made as much money that year as the people across the road that was renting out their bungalows for a lot cheaper to the Thai. Um, so this is like a, it's kind of a niche tourism opportunity that's much more controlled by the community. Um, I'm going to just, just go to the conclusion. So what I want to point out and what the next few slides kind of do, actually there's an interesting set of quotes, I'll show you that because that's fun. Um, what I want to show you is that there's a lot of differences in how these different communities, as well as individual households, articulate with market, market opportunities that they either sought out or that have been presented to them. There's a high degree of variation, and there's a whole ton of factors that help explain that variation. Um, the first one is being demonstrated in some of these quotes, right? So when someone comes here with an idea of how to make money, we'll do it if we think it'll work. We we'll won't do it if we don't think it'll work. Fair enough. Uh, people here think short term. When I asked my wife about planting coffee, she said, what are you going to do? Eat nothing but coffee? This is the thinking of this village. So these are from the two communities I first talked about, and it really shows the sort of different comfort with risk and different comfort with sort of um, the, the, the amount of control they can have over something and the, the speed at which they want to move. But also in Doi Antanon, there's a strong sense that there's two different kinds of people. People who don't want to grow flowers or people who have maybe many family responsibilities don't want to spend the time to grow rice, they're happy, they think of the way of sufficiency if they don't want to become rich. This is explained ethnically at times. The Korean are likely not to be as enthusiastic in my experience. They're satisfied in spending their life in nature. They're not a greedy people, not like the monk. I see that the monk are more tradesmen like habits. And he was, this guy was trying to tell me why different ethnic groups are in different kinds of flowers. And it's like, apparently it's an essentialist, um, you know, drive that they have to either be accumulation types or sufficiency types. So there is this like distinct development culture in different communities around risk. And this, a lot of this can be explained through their historic relationship to outsiders and the way they're networked into the political economy, but also past development strategies, the royal project itself, um, their exposure effectively to different kinds of market-based strategies, the degree of knowledge of risk they have. And that's the case at the village level, but also at the individual level. Um, so in order to get concluded, <laughs> that was the main point, is that there's all these factors, household variation, comfort with risk, the amount of social networks that they're linked into and the ways in which they can use those networks, if they belong to the church or not, which church, that matters. Um, a lot of information around employment opportunities came through kids who were going to school in the city. So if you didn't have a kid that went to school in the city, you didn't have access to certain kinds of information. Your social network was a lot different. Um, and also the luck of the trial when it came to where your property happens to be in relation to water, in relation to roads. Um, and that's not all luck of the draw, right? That has to do with sort of power relationships within the community. The economy and all the rest of it. So I have a whole bunch of factors here. Um, <coughs> well, why does it matter? 
So, of course, I love to be able to answer these questions. Are they being liberated by capital? Well, yes and no, right? It's always a yes and no. Um, it really matters uh, what type of bargain engagement, right? So I think that those two tourism uh, initiatives have really different outcomes. It's still a tourism market. It's a slightly different tourist market, right? So that matters. It matters how much control the community had over its development. It matters how much control and how cohesive the committee is. You know, when asked about what went wrong across the street, at the other, the first tourism um, initiative, the explanation was always that they had lots of problems, they weren't co they didn't have a strong enough committee to be able to deal with the problems as they arose. So those people bolted and just built their own tourism facilities. Um, and also, like, different kinds of crops have really different outcomes in terms of the ways <coughs> which people engage them. But the terms under which the, the engagement takes place also really matters. So the implications for the proponents of market-based conservation. One is you need to be aware of the ironic effects of some of this the integration into the market economy. It happens much faster when, when people are forced into decision-making mode because they've lost their land, right? And that, and that means that you can actually have a perfectly successful conservation strategy, apparently, um, that actually has the ironic effects of losing biodiversity. Unintended. But that's what happens. Um, or pesticide use actually threatening the persistence of bird species or certain kinds of animal species, right? So these aren't things that were planned. They happened basically because people didn't stop to think about it. And in the case of shifting cultivation anyway and biodiversity loss, there's still a very strong wilderness ethic that suggests that human use of forest is somehow antithetical to conservation, right? And so in the, that's, a, that's a different paper, but that's um, <coughs> other people have written about it. But in terms of um, biodiversity loss associated with the elimination of shifting cultivation. Sort of so I think that, that the proponents need to be, uh, you know, be aware and be concerned about simple metrics of conservation. So more forest equals good conservation isn't always the case. Um, and a larger park versus a smaller park isn't always the case. The absence of humans versus the presence of certain kinds of human activity isn't always the best metric, right? Neither is how much income is being earned. So they basically doubled their income in both of those first two communities I spoke of, with really different social and commercial outcomes associated with that. So the simple metrics need to be questioned. Um, and also just a stronger recognition that residents' aspirations, their personalities, their experiences, and social relations inform their life and decisions. They're not all going to be willing to do what you ask them to do, and, and often for really good reason. And the implications for opponents of market-based conservation is that, I and mean, this is just a pet peeve of mine, and this is a certain group of opponents, right? So there are some people who really don't like market-based livelihood because they're worried about it ruining um, fortress conservation, right? But that's not how I'm talking about. Um, we have to recognize that it actually does work sometimes for some ecological indicators. We're going to grapple with that reality, um, and for some people. There are simply some market articulations that are less violent than others, right? So there are some perfect, no, but maybe best case scenarios or uh, scenarios that are better for conservation and development than others, right? So we need to, we need to not paint them all with the same brush. Um, <laughs> this is another good view of mine. So recognize that residents have genuine aspirations and grapple with that, um, but also that market incentives are sometimes preferable to state and that, and that we're dealing with people who have that kind of stark choice in front of them, right? So if, if they don't take a market incentive, then they're probably taking, you know, something worse. Um, so put, kind of, <coughs> um, but simply, I think taking the contingent character of markets, um, of market integration seriously, it allows us to go beyond the sort of capitalism is good or bad rhetoric that, that, that a lot of this stuff is painted with. Uh, towards supporting the sorts of markets with the sorts of power relations that give rise to the best case scenario. It's not a win-win. There are losses being involved, uh, but it's the best case scenario for both conservation and development goals. And the lessons from two of the folks that I work with, um, you know, maybe we just need to move slower. Maybe that's a good idea. And the other one is, is uh, kind of he's talking about the alignment with what political power that he sees. NGOs have many problems because they have strong ideas against government, but government has lots of power, so they fight a lot, and he never sees them win. So we're lucky uh, to be able to work with all of these different stakeholders. And so, and this is the guy who runs that um, Thailand Au Clement, uh tourist facility. He's the community guy who's normally in charge. Um, and so he's actually developed a genuine partnership between private sector, uh, government, to 
the real project, um, and park staff, right? And so it's sort of, a, and the community members, it's sort of a genuine multi-stakeholder governance system there, which is 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 moving. It's a moving target, I don't know, you know. But it's uh, but he's suggesting that's what it was for.